Being so happy tonight. <laughs> she likes it so much. <laughs> Hello and welcome to um, <clears throat> the 30th anniversary lectures piece by peaceful means at the Transnational Foundation in Lund, Sweden. We are happy to know that you are sitting out there because we have about 175 people joining on Facebook and a number of other people from outside in very many different countries. This session is totally imaginative, mm -hmm. it is dream-wise, if you will, what would the world that we would like and that we work for look like in 2045? You know, if you cannot imagine a better future, you cannot work for it. Quotation, one of the greatest peace researchers, Elisa Boulding. If you can't imagine it, you won't work for it. And we sometimes think that peace work should be about imagining a better world and work for it instead of just working against all the problems and all the militarism and violence that we see. So we are five people this afternoon, um, board members and associates who are gathered here to a little festivity. We'd like to share our more or less mad, wild, imaginative, utopian ideas with you and make possible some discussions out there where you see that this session here is probably very difficult to make any comments, but you're welcome always to send comments to tff at transnational.org. So, about five minutes each, and then we will simply say cheers and hope you will have something to drink out there too uh, for that better world and for the fact that we've been around for 30 years. Totally independent and committed to the same basic value, namely piece by piece for me. The first person to come up here is Dr. Gunnar Westberg, who has been with us for many years, you can say that yourself, but he will now tell you about his desired world in the year 2045. Welcome, Gunnar. Well, thank you, John. I am Gunnar Westberg. Uh, I've worked mostly with uh, nuclear weapons and I most am concerned every morning with what little wisdom this world is governed. And that's the reason we have the nuclear weapons. But now, we are in 2045, and a month ago, on August the 6th, the century of slavery under the nuclear threat ended. It ended and the bell from Hiroshima sounded. But else, the nuclear era ended not with a bang, but with songs. For 30 years, there had been this arms race between the United States and China, nuclear arms race. The Chinese, they showed their new nuclear missiles at the parades on the 1st of May, year in and year out. Thousands and thousands of missiles. The US had to keep up. Trillions of dollars were invested in new nuclear weapons. The country became increasingly impoverished. Americans, North Americans went to Mexico and Guatemala to find jobs and find food. There were bread queues in New York. Medical care deteriorated. Our USA was on the brink of falling apart. But China flourished. How was that possible? <laughs> the resentment against China increased. So when the Chinese declared that they were going to take over Taiwan, which would be rather popular in poor Taiwan, the United States had to live up to its commitment to protect Taiwan. I will just order our forces to destroy the evil empire of China, said the President of the United States, Jennifer Bush who was a transvestite, who really needed to show her masculinity. <laughs> Hold it, said the Chinese. We have no nuclear weapons. The missiles are just empty shells. They will be filled with candy to be distributed at the centennial of the People's Republic of China. Call back the missiles. <laughs> Too late. Missiles cannot be called back. 
the world was going to be destroyed. But the Soviet reached North Koreans. They thought the missiles were meant for them only. So they launched a missile with a 100 megaton bomb and the embalmed body of the great leader in the bomb. The bomb <laughs> exploded at a height of 40 kilometers, sending an enormous electromagnetic pulse to all the satellites in the world. Or maybe it was the power of the great leader, Kim Il Sung, who destroyed the satellites and the GPS systems. <laughs> so the American missiles, they lost their bearings. And as programmed in the case of system failure, they went straight to the North Pole aiming for the Russian flag at the sea floor there and burying themselves in the mud under the ice with no explosion. Then a fleet of strategic bombers came from North Korea without GPS as guidance because they had the guidance of the eternal president's teaching. And they flew to California and landed at Disneyland. <laughs> Out came an all-female crew in their ridiculous uniforms with very short skirts. They waved the ultimate weapon, the little blue songbook with the songs of the dear little Kim Jong-il. Singing, they took over Disneyland, the land of their dreams. And songs were heard everywhere from huge loudspeakers in space sending the songs praising the North Korean leaders all over the world. The US leaders got the message, nuclear weapons are useless. All military men were thus sent to the academies of music. Military orchestras were reborn. The songs by Jennifer Bush competed with the equally awful songs from North Korea. Everyone had their hands over their ears to stop the music. No one could handle a gun. A gun. Uh, I'm longing back to the nuclear era from this awful music. But I have found a good defense. I have found this Atomic Age headphones made in 1975. <laughs> they not only protect me from all this noise, they also provide me with nice old tunes. I have just found the recordings of an old group called ABBA. <laughs> and I'm happy again. <laughs> <laughs> Benner, and I'm one of the two founders of the Transnational Foundation for Peace and Future Research. And imagine that this is the year 2045, that is 30 years from now. And uh, we are sitting or standing here on a cozy cloud uh, looking down on the earth. And actually it doesn't look so bad. Uh, the sky is quite clear and uh, there happened a few things in 2015. Uh, the few insights dawned upon people more and more. Um, one was that the earth did not have more than five to ten years if it to, to change the direction. And uh, there also was the fact that 60 million of refugees were fleeing their countries because of war. Half of them children. But it, it wasn't really until a, a three-year-old child was washed ashore on a small island in the Mediterranean that people really woke up and that set um, a will to, to help that did not only was to give money but also to um, uh, welcome 
the refugees in several countries, in several places, uh, and to do something for them. Uh, so meetings uh, happened and many meetings uh, developed into dialogues and when you have a dialogue between people from different walks of life uh, sometimes it happens that you find new solutions to old problems. Uh, and then there are also the insight that, well, since the um, demographic situation of Europe was not very good with an aging population, why not uh, take advantage of these old refugees that wanted to come? Uh, and, and there also was the insight that uh, Peter Lovell uh, was a, or is a, um, a Swedish lawyer, and he once said that behind every refugee there is an arms trader. So that fact also became common knowledge, and people were no longer fooled by the by the um, politicians of uh, many countries who argued for uh, hunting the, the, the uh, refugee um, smugglers instead. So they realized that it, it, war, it was war that was behind. And war is the outcome of greed, evilness, and a desire to, to uh, control others. Uh, and actually at that time, 2015, it had become quite common that uh, people saw greed as something uh, as a virtue, actually, not as one of the deadly sins that it has had been used to before. Um, but as I said, insights, uh, that was one insight too. So uh, uh, in, instead, a new rule of conduct slowly came, and that was KGB. And that is strange, but you can see KGB and ki as kindness, generosity, yeah. and beauty. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Cynthia Dongozi. I'm from Burundi, and uh, I'm a new associate to TFF. I would like you to imagine the next generation, the generations of uh, our children, or maybe for a uh, generation of our grandchildren. Um, and please, let's take a good look, because their world can be a different world. Their world can be a world where they can live and work um, without any fear of terrorism, without any fear <laughs> of violence without any fear of uh, gender-based violences. They word can be a word where power can be shared, regardless of gender, religious, or ethnic conflict. They word can be a word where the, all the people in the world just have access to the same opportunities for life and for happiness. Um, the word can just be a peaceful word, a, a word of abundance. And uh, the question is, how will you, I mean, you who are, who is looking at us, how will you join this revolution? The, re the response, the answer has to be now. And I hope 
the TFF is helping, is doing the best to make it happen. Um, I would like to invite you also to you to to the fact that I would like to finish uh, to finish by telling you that I really believe that we can create this world. We can make this future happening. We can create the future we want. Uh, I, I don't want to be long, but uh, let me finish by uh, saying this quote from uh, Mother Teresa that I really like, where she says, we can do no great things, but we can do small things with great love. Tonight it's cheers for to committing to do those small things with great love for each other. And uh, also this quote for, uh, from Maya Angelou where she says, we cannot control what, happening, what is happening to us, but we can um, work so that we cannot be reduced by them. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Hey, I'm Annette Schiffman from Germany. I've been uh, an associate and a board member to TFF for 13 years. Um, I have more clear vision of the year 2045, but I have a vision of what we would love to gain. As a little girl, the one thing I wanted most was justice. And the other one thing I wanted most was fun and laughter. And ever since those two one things I wanted most stayed with me for the better time of my life. Um, it is not always easy to combine the two. And when I was a young woman, I tended to be on a very high horse, um, thinking I knew better than most. Um, that um, vanished over the years and I'm happy that it did. So I feel a little more uh, gentle towards other people and the world in general. But what stayed with me is the desire for justice and fun and how to combine the two. So the older I grew, the more I believed in the fact that people can change, that every and each of us can change and has the two things in themselves, the desire for justice and the desire for um, more joy. And I think it's possible that people change when you manage to change their surroundings. So, in my world, all people, mostly men that go to the military, would change their jobs. And instead of shooting, they would be sent to kindergartens and care for the little kids every day, day in, day out. And within a very short period of time, I can see them changing because they experience very different things than they did before. Uh, in my world, the zillions of tanks that are on this globe would be rebuilt into, say, partly race cars, because <laughs> many men <laughs> like the fun of competition and dangerous competition at that, so they could funnel that desire into their new race cars and 
show how good they are by not shooting at each other, but by winning with the car. Um, and my word, prisoners that are filling the prisons all over the world would be either sent home at once, because most of them don't deserve to be there anyway, and the real bad guys and girls would be sent to useful work in the outside world. And it would change their views. They would be sent to rebuild the communities that are broken, the houses that are in bad shape. And they would identify with those community parts and change their views, I think. And in my world, Many architects would be sent to live in the houses they built, and that would greatly improve our environment because that would be the moment when they realize what they did to others. And in my world, all the bureaucrats that are sitting um, behind their desks, um, shaping rules, and rules after rules, only by looking down on their desk, they would be sent outside to sweep the streets, to um, do useful things for the community. And then they could go back and they would see the world differently. So in my world, people would have the opportunity to change their own ways and then we all would be living happily ever after. Thank you. <laughs> yep. yes. Well, imagine that every so-called leader, whoever that is, had a driving license. You know why we have driving license? You talked about cars already. Uh -huh. We have driving license, licenses to get safely from point A to B without violence or with as little violence as possible. And we educate ourselves to drive cars. We know about cars and traffic signs in order to be able to do that. That's actually a, an attempt at nonviolence. Now, the, 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 the driving license I would like leaders to have would be the one that brings them to peace. You know, there is no prime minister, foreign minister, or defense minister who has a peace or conflict resolution expert among his advisors or her advisors. They are military, they have lawyers, they have career diplomats uh, and marketing companies because their messages are not good enough so they have to market them uh, by professional commercial means. But what if they all had at least a weekend course in the kind of things we teach, such as how to analyze a conflict without taking a stand automatically between the good guys and the bad guys, but look at the problem that stands between people, which is a conflict. What about if they had an education? In conflict resolution means negotiations, mediation, consultation, formal and informal. What if they had people who told them alternatives to wars so they had something to do before they start a war or start their F-16s and bomb different countries? What if they knew something about forgiveness and reconciliation? Or as the famous Danish designer and poet and architect, philosopher, uh, Pete Hein once said that one day the art of, of, of is, of um, the art of saying sorry will one day save the human race. This idea that yes, we made a mistake and maybe by saying that we give credibility and honor, if you will, to the victims of what we do. Big and small things every day. So driving license is something I hope all politicians, prime ministers, etc., will have in the year 2045. If they have that, we could hope for something else, much more important perhaps. Namely that we would have a world in which people and civil society gain strength again. 
where so-called non-governmental organizations are really non and not near governmental organizations. My dear friends, if my reading over the last 30 years is that what we call a non-governmental organization and civil society is dying out and becoming more and more dependent on governments, and therefore they become near-governmental. It applies to research, it applies to even peace movements and many others. They get something from the state and they say the politically correct things. In my view, somebody who said it, I don't know who, who said people, civil society is the only superpower on earth. I think that's true. We should decline being run by governments and practice the democracy that is about people making decisions in new structures. It is not democracy to say yes or no to an alternative somebody else has set up. Democracy is to be able to make the alternatives, to choose what to vote for. It is not to have political parties, it's how we act every day in a political culture. So, democracy is an important point, and it's time we democratize democracy. We have national democracies in a globalizing world in which we have global military forces and we have global economy, but we only have national and sub-national democracies. That's ridiculous, it's out of tune. What is the use that I can vote in my national par for my national parliament when more and more of my, of my future life is decided out there in the big world? So let's have at least as a beginning of globalizing democracy that each one of us could, for instance, vote on those who represent us and who should represent our countries or communities in the international uh, forums, such as NATO or the UN or OSC or whatever it is. Why should we not be able to elect them in public uh, processes like we elect our parliamentarians? Fourth, and perhaps last, not to make this too long, there's absolutely no connection anymore between defense, defense policies and what threatens the world. Defense is something run by the military, industrial, media, academic complex, MIMAC, totally outside democratic control. Former President Eisenhower in the US warned us against it in his farewell speech, if I remember correctly, in 62, and everything has just gotten worse since then. You first have these weapons developed, you have all the researchers, you have the military, you have the economy, you have the corporations, and then you invent a threat, not the other way around. Let's imagine that all these people, as Annette was hinting, got another good job. All the military I know, they always say, we work for peace, I don't want a war. Fine, then come over and let's have a dialogue on what is the most efficient way of making peace. All your nuclear weapons, all your interventions, all your bombings, all your drones, or what? Has the world become better for what the, after what the military, industrial, media, academic complex did? My answer is no. And we cannot just get rid of the nuclear weapons and the overarmament and the ridiculous, absurd resource waste without alternatives. If you can't imagine the future, as I quoted Edith Bowling saying, you will also not work for it. My future is one in which all countries or communities have a right to self-defense, military and civilian, defensive defense, something that cannot reach out and bomb anybody far away, but can be strong if somebody comes to your country. Secondly, civil defense, and a population educated in nonviolence and resistance. The only thing that has succeeded the last 40, 50 years since Gandhi liberated with his people, the Indian colony from the British Empire, is nonviolence. Nonviolence has a much better record than all these wars that NATO has fought the last 20 years. We can do better. And one day we will look back upon these last 30 years with the same disgust as we do today on slavery. It is not compatible with human civilization. We can do better and we will do better in the future. And I think that's where we will have to end it today. Violence is an awfully bad idea. The direct violence, the psychological violence, the structural violence, the gender violence, and the violence against nature. We can do better than that. It will require education. I started out with a driving license. Education will come in the future, not in schools, but on the internet. So imagine that this little iPhone over there that is broadcasting this to the world, not only does that, or helps us with a lot of other things,
but it has apps for education and things. So that everybody who buys a phone, everybody who sits in Africa, can get education in the most important thing of all, how to survive, how to treat your fellow human beings good, in a nice way, in a kind way, in a way that serves yourself. It is fully possible, friends. Education is going to change tremendously in the next 30 years. And we will all be better educated than having bad teachers in a school we didn't like to go to. But thanks to modern technology, social media, etc., we can mobilize the superpower that is the only real superpower. And that's us. Us standing here, us sitting out there, us in that world that we can make. And we can make it better than Obama did. <laughs> so now we are going to have a little celebration. So sit on for 30 seconds more. Come on now. As we're going to. <laughs> we will shoot, and that's the only shot you will ever hear from the Transnational Foundation. What shots? But you will hear this one. If it happens. <laughs> it happens. And there's no technical failure here. I hope. Yes! Mimi, don't do it. Even Mimi is getting it. Oops! Don't take it, Mimi. Well, look, there's more than just bubbles. Yes, oh, I hope you have something too. Okay. So cheers to that much better world that we certainly can create. Cheers to ourselves for having endured 30 years. Oh yeah. And cheers oh, to you clack, clack, clack. for your work for peace, Jeez. justice, and a better environment, a better world. Cheers. Go on now. And see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Local when, uh, time. Local time, yes. Uh, Central European summertime. <laughs> where summertime. you will... Summertime. Yeah, you would like right. to sing that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, no, no singing that. <laughs> and you will actually be the one talking about how we get rid of nuclear weapons. Yes, certainly. Without Please. perhaps the help of the North Koreans. Not this time, no. Not this but, time, uh, no. Okay. Thank you very much for today. Have a good evening, or a good day, or good morning, wherever you are. No nukes. No nukes. So Mimi did it.